Okay, so we have about 25 minutes. Uh, what we had talked about was having comments on what the different speakers said, so obviously feel free to comment directly to any of them in terms of the comments they've made. And of course, feel free to bring up uh, additional comments. So who'd like to start? Would prefer to start with someone junior uh, or who hasn't spoken yet, please. Hi, Brittany Lassane from Hudson Alpha. Um, so my comment is mainly directed at Onshul, but if anybody else has um, feedback as well. So I'm wondering to the extent this idea of using transfer learning to think about context dependency, particularly with respect to moving between model organisms or between diseases. Um, I'm wondering if we can't combine that with this idea of breaking down silos. So the data is at all these other institutes or controlled by different groups. Um, and we could use that data as first steps in these transfer learning processes. So I'm wondering if you think the data is there to do that and what the process for going about that might be. Yeah, so I think that's a, that's a really good point and a great idea. And I think the, the key point is to have a minimal set of uh, assays you can actually do in the, in the other domain, uh, the, the test domain. Uh, it's, it's impossible generally to transfer without having some kind of side information. So the idea is in one domain you can do a lot of interesting you know, assays, perturbations, whatever, whatever, and in the other domain you can do a minimal set and how do you transfer effectively. So I think this would also justify model organism research very well because when people say a mouse model is a bad model for a disease, it's typically because you're expecting whatever you see in the mouse model to directly transfer to the human uh, case. Uh, the adaptation style strategy is, is much harder, but is feasible. And I, so I, I, I do think that computational tools that help transfer information across species will actually reinvigorate uh, the usefulness of animal models and other species um, uh, for human research. Okay, first Eric, and then way over there in the corner. First, thanks for all the great integration. I think it's an amazing set of ideas. I wanted to uh, just briefly talk about the common disease observation that most of the sequencing is going on elsewhere. That's true. But shockingly, when you talk about amassing enough cases of any given disease, it's not happening. Um, the largest disease case collections that are being sequenced most of them are still getting done under NHGRI. Most of the institutes are doing tiny numbers. Um, you know, if you figure that the median gene has an LOF frequency of about one in 10,000, until you're at many tens of thousands, you don't even see multiple events. So it's my sense that NHGRI has, has this special ability to, I'll put it in this room this way, tell other institutes what to do to be rigorous about it. And I think even though we shouldn't be paying for most of that sequencing, the leadership to define the scale of studies needed to do something and probably to get credibility at the table, you pay for something of that, has got to come from, from NHGRI because I think only in this community is there a deep enough understanding of the, the power issues and the ability to cross cut. So I'd love to see within a plan a way to use NHGRI's pulpit and convening power and a little bit of its money to ensure that say for at least 10 diseases, we have really serious sample sizes. Because without it, you know, large biobanks and cohorts won't give us enough cases. The entire half million people in the UK biobank have only 1,200 epilepsies and 300 schizophrenias and so, in any case, I, I, I want to make sure that we don't feel that because m the most sequences happen elsewhere, we're off the hook for organizing the world in the right way. No, I totally agree with that, Eric. I think it's exceptionally important that we play that sort of role. I think it's also exceptionally important we convince the other uh, institutes to foot most of the bill because this is <laughs> such a small institute. But, but playing the leadership mm -hmm. role, encouraging the sa sample sizes that are necessary, building the technological, statistical, computational tools that are necessary to make this more feasible, more economical, um, from my perspective, is absolutely central to NHGRI's mission and, and will continue to be. And next one was over there. 
Yeah, so Mathieu Lupien from the Princess Margaret Cancer Center in Toronto. Um, so with regards to the variations, we've talked about making sense of the genetic variation. And I think that we're also very much poised to be able to start assessing the role of epigenetic variation, whether it is driven by genetic variation or independent of genetic variation. I mean, there's clear evidence that from a predisposition standpoint, as much as from a somatic mutation standpoint, that there's convergence of some of these changes to specific loci. It would make total sense that these loci are also affected by epigenetic variation. And so I think that there's an opportunity to start quantifying that variation and then subsequently to include it in their functional interpretation as you're describing here for the genetic component. Yeah, point well taken. Uh, next was Rick and then Heidi and then Bob. Just a real quick thing about Eric's comment. I, I agree with all of that. I think we need to be careful not to sound like we think in HDRI or we are the only ones who know how to do this when we're interacting, not to mention that some of those other institutes are in the room. Some of that has been really, really good. And no, no, but I, seriously, because we've gotten into trouble with this before. I think a leadership role, but that really also means working with them, not, you know, not telling them what to do. For sure. That's maybe a small point, but I think it would smooth the way if we're, we're just a little, we're, we present that in a way where it doesn't sound like we think we're the only ones. No, it's particularly important given that we're trying to get people to, uh, come to our way of thinking, it's absolutely essential. Um, Heidi. So just uh, following on Eric and Rick's comments, I, you know, I, if we t look at the volume of samples coming into the CMGs and other programs like at UDN, there's a order of magnitude more volume for rare disease samples that goes into the clinical labs. If you take just one lab in Vitae, their volume from last year was 300,000 cases. And there's, of course, hundreds of labs. So you know, the vast majority of the <laughs> rare disease cases from which we can gain immense data is outside of all of our hands and all of NIH. Uh, and this came up briefly yesterday, but I think we should really think seriously about partnerships with industry, because the only way those phenotypes are getting gathered right now is people like myself are sending emails <coughs> and, and getting incredibly low volume <laughs> resu results, you know, from case sharing. But if we could set up mechanisms for that data to be shared in ways that could inform you know, gene discovery and variant interpretation, we would just have a massive resource uh, that's totally untapped right now in, in our space. No, that's, that's, that's really important. And, and thinking longer term, I, I, I really believe that as exome or genome sequencing becomes standard of care, we, we access and even we have the potential at least to access an even larger uh, set of, of, of data that if we do this right could, could revolutionize the way we do business. So not just those would be a lot, but the, the, the larger scale would be even uh, another level of magnitude. Um, I think Bob Mike, was I, next and then Kelly and then Aviv. Mike, could I just comment? Please, Ask, please. Uh, Heidi, uh, the number you cited was from Invite. Yeah. And how much of that is panel versus how much is exome? So for Invite, their volume is primarily panel, whereas if you take GeneDX, they have a much higher exome right, volume. Right. Yeah, important to distinguish. Okay, Bob. Hi, Bob Karp from NIDDK, one of those other institutes. <laughs> uh, we, Rick already answered I, for us. So, right. So, I, I'd like to endorse what what Rick said with uh, with just one one minor disagreement. He said it's a small point. I'd like to point out that's actually a large point. Um, we think we're doing all right with genetics of IBD. You've, you've heard from Judy Cho, who's here, here at this meeting. Uh, we, we think we're doing all right with genetics of diabetes and obesity. We have Karen Mulkey here, uh, who could elaborate on, on that point. So uh, we're, you know, we don't believe that we know absolutely everything, and we're, we're always happy to take advice. Uh, when, when we're treated as equals. Okay. Point taken. Uh, Kelly. Hi. So this is actually a little bit um, on a different topic, and it is in an area that I actually don't have expertise in in policy. So it seems to me that I'll, I'll, 
One of the big impediments into sharing large data sets, we've been talking about how we're going to aggregate a lot of these data, are the historical consents and yeah. the restrictions on those consents. And is it in the purview of NHGRI to figure out if there's any mechanisms by which those consents could be revisited and made more broad? I think probably many of the people who signed those consents really didn't realize, and the people that were consenting didn't realize how much of an impediment it would make um, now and in the future moving forward on our ability to use existing data as well as use those, those uh, highly phenotyped samples to generate additional data. Now, I think it's a, a really important point. Um, it, it, it is a logistical challenge, of course, um, um, but, but, I, but I really do believe and believe for a long time that there's a moral imperative to use the data, to use the samples that people have so generously donated. And I suspect there's a very large fraction of people whose data are not being made broadly available who would be appalled if they learned it. We have to balance that, of course, with issues of privacy, confidentiality, appropriate consent, but it, it, it's, it's, it is a really hard issue. Other folks want to comment? Oh, yeah, where's Laura? I'm right here. Oh, sorry, yeah, perfect one to respond. Okay, I was just gonna say that I would echo everything that Mike just said in terms of the complexities for existing data. Um, I think to your point that NHGRI does have a role to play in trying to shape the direction for future consents within NIH and thinking about what best practices and policies can be. And then I think there are also ways to think about broader issues for what we have now, though in some cases when it's very explicit, there, that, that is what it is and we always need to be respectful, but are there ways to work with this to make it better? Maybe going forward, I think there are big changes that, that we should try to move the agency toward um, with all of the appropriate caveats that you still have to have for individual circumstances associated with study populations and study designs. Yeah, so I agree moving forward and everyone I think agrees moving forward right. that consents need to be broad. But, but I don't know actually that there is accepted broad agreement outside of this community. And so there is a role to make sure that that, that becomes something that, that we can implement beyond just studies that NHGRI is putting forward as much as we can be a leader. But, but to, so to follow up Mike's point, I think a lot of the people that have generously donated uh, either their selves or their, their, their relatives in passing, their um, uh, tissues, et cetera, would be appalled to know the restrictions that we have um, imposed on the community and using those resources. Right, and I guess that's what I was trying to get to in terms of thinking about ways to work through that in broad strokes. And, and can, is there research to be done to think about what attitudes are about that that might inform being able to make different choices around what ex prior language might say? Those, I think, are things that, that can be explored. In some cases, we're just gonna have hard answers. Um, but I do think it's worth pushing yeah, perhaps one last comment on this is, as we're deciding the samples that we will use for large-scale studies going forward, we need to be even more focused on getting verified certain information that samples truly are as broadly usable as they're initially suggested to be, because that, that doesn't always, doesn't always happen as, as well as we would like. I think we need to move on to additional issues. Uh, Aviv was next, and then Mark. And um, we'll go from there. And Ben, okay. I have a relatively minor comment, but it might turn out to be meaningful. So in one of the proposed projects, I think that Anshul put up, um, he talked about doing maybe 400, it said, cell types across thousands, say, of individuals. I wanted to press a little bit from a point of view that thinks about isolating different types of cells to a point of view that looks at individual cells as they are in the tissue. 
it's a really important distinction in practice, and the latter was simply not something we could do in the past, and we can easily do today. And that should be the bar because it is more um, authentic um, and faithful to behavior in the body and would also allow us to identify things such as those cell-cell interactions that were alluded to. Fair. Mark's next. I just wanted to say a few things about the uh, consent issue. Uh, obviously, broad consent is very important, but I think we can actually do a lot more there. I think as important as broad is standardized. I think if, if consents were standardized and people could deal with them in a more mechanized, automated fashion, it would make aggregating data sets much, much easier. Uh, if there was a more templated way to apply for data sets, people could do it much more efficiently and they would use data sets more. And then also I would like to point out that maybe we should think a little bit about sort of, um, how should I say, privacy research where we can think about how to, to some degree, anonymize data sets and summarize them and make them useful even if we don't release the entirety of the data sets. And I think a lot could be done in those directions. Great. Bing, and then back over here. Um, <clears throat> I have three points to make. I, I completely echo what uh, Aviv just said about our current capability of um, detecting molecular uh, signatures from uh, cells, from primary tissues, using single cell technology, single cell attack or high C, that, that is doable. I want to make two points about resources that could really advance the topic of discovery and interpretation of variants associated with health and disease. Uh, one resource I think uh, touched upon by Anshu is focusing on transcription factors I think we really need empirical data on transcription factor DNA interactions. Um, our current model of using PWMs, I think it's very uh, good for the last 20, 30 years, but it's not, well, it's showing its age. So we need, we need better models uh, guided by better data, in vitro data. Second resource we desperately need is quantum organization in different cell types. Uh, I think people are showing case by case that such information is aiding us predicting the targets of sequence variants. Uh, and yet when we look at um, how much such information is available today, they're largely restricted to cell lines or t primary tissues. They're not uh, in the cell type that we're talking about disease are relevant to disease, and we desperately need that type of resource. Thank you. And way back in the corner. Hey, Eris Aiden, uh, Baylor College of Medicine. So I, I really wanted to echo um, some of the points that Heidi uh, made. I mean, I think if you think about where we're going to be at in 2030, it's probably the case that the vast majority of genomic data is going to be held by companies. Uh, why these companies would share their databases um, unless we've somehow, you know, figured out how to work with them beforehand is very, very unclear. I mean, if you've got a database of everyone's genome uh, and affiliated data, that is better than, in many ways, patenting. Uh, large piles of genes. And I think we could end up actually in the worst possible siloed situation, which is that the best data silos are the ones that public researchers can't access. Uh, and I think this is a, a really big concern that we need to think about. Sharon, and then back there. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up that I, that industry here has actually been um, quite willing to share. The largest submitters to ClinVar actually are for-profit testing companies with a few exceptions. And it's interesting. There are some exceptions who have exactly the opinion that Eris just gave, which is the data is valuable and they don't want to share it. Uh, the vast majority, and I give kudos to Heidi for this, have been you know, convinced that data sharing actually is useful for the community and are doing it. Ambry has been actively involved in research programs with the hereditary cancer community. So I don't think we should go into it assuming they don't want to. I think we have to figure out even better ways and structured ways to share. Um, and the point about structured consent and structured ways to share are critical because what they are concerned about is the cost of doing this. Fair. And back there. Yeah, so I just 
want to remind us, you know, innovation traditionally comes from academia. It almost never comes from industry. You'll have a company that will have a million patients. As long as their margins are preserved, you expect no innovation from them. They'll just keep plugging up the money. So, you know, we have a special role in the ecosystem of making everything more accessible. And then I think as a, as a community representative, I want to give you another slogan to think about. You know, if you're not careful, your consortia become cartels. I don't think you want your consortia to become cartels. And I'll give you again the example, again, as a community uh, representative. You know, we've downloaded data from the centers of Mendelian genomics multiple times, version one, version two, version three. My students are tired of me asking. I keep telling them, no, no, maybe they'll realize Maybe they'll do something good with it. They'll actually deposit the phenotype. So I think the CMGs are actually a great example of centers. You know, it would be better if they didn't put their data there, because you either share in a way that we can use, or you don't share at all. But if you use it, if you deposit it in a way that we can't use it, and say, well, it's shared, you know, it's a wonderful resource for the community, I think we're doing a disservice to the community. And through the community, and through innovation, we're doing a disservice to the patients. If you can provide a little more specifics in an email to the group, it would be useful. Uh, Aaron and then Richard. So I just wanted to follow up on Sharon's comment about the clinical lab submissions to ClinVar. <clears throat> One issue that we still have is that the clinical testing labs only have limited phenotypic data that they can share. From what I understand, that's how that how it goes with the testing company. So that's an area that we need to work on to take advantage of these large submissions to ClinVar. Thank you. Richard? Uh, yeah, Richard gibbs Baylor. Um, there's a, a long-term discussion about technologies that will allow deep and rich mining of protected data without exposure of the data. Were those, I'm sorry if I missed it, did you discuss those technologies and the priority for them to be developed further in your group? Does it uh, make sense what I'm saying? The, for protected data? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The idea that you can send your bots in or whatever and do the mining and do a lot of your discovery without actually visi you know, being visible to the primary data. Yeah, no, I mean, we didn't discuss that. I, it, I think some of it might happen tomorrow. Yeah. I think there are data resource related as, yeah, but there have been private conversations on that front. I think it's a very important point, but I don't think it was actively discussed in the last two days. And Mark did bring up related sort of issues as well, so yes, that's certainly exactly. something that we should yeah. be talking about. Uh, and Howard? Oh, sorry. Uh, Howard Jacob from AbbVie. So uh, there are more and more pre-compete activities going on with pharma, uh, and I think it's important to, for this community to keep an eye on that. Um, you know, uh, UK Biobank, the sequencing with Regeneron, that's all going to be in the public domain a, a year after it's been paid for. Uh, there's huge amounts of data that needs to be analyzed, and I think there are, are mechanisms uh, to be looking at how do we do this on a pre-compete level, because everybody has the same problem. There's lots of data, lots of interest in, in how do we analyze it. So I'd like to suggest that we keep that open as a solution, because it is being done by other groups. Uh, no reason why we can't do it here. Shihan. Yeah, I want to make some comments about the, the consent. So for both TopMed and uh, also GSP, even the total sample size which had been sequenced is 350,000 people, but only 20% of both consortiums and the, uh, the consent are for general research use. So, so that means about 70,000 people, uh, the samples can be used for general research use, but assuming 50% of them are cases. That means we only even uh, only have about we only have about three. 35,000 people, which can be used as a common controls. And so reconsent those existing cohorts is hard. So therefore, something like all of us, this is more like uh, prospective studies and consent subject up front, that would be really valuable. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Being very purposeful there, being very careful there, very being broad there is, is incredibly important. Um, last final comment. Relatively brief, we have 14 seconds. <laughs> okay, sure, so this is going back to Anshul's uh, great presentation about transfer learning. So another area or context that you could probably consider, the NACR could consider, is age. So you can imagine getting readout information from healthy tissue samples of a younger tissue population is 
impossible to get. Um, maybe you could get it for like a few tissues at a few specific ages, but can you leverage machine learning algorithms to basically predict, say for example, expression by leveraging adult human maps, for example? Um, that would reduce the cost of having to sequence or have to figure out how to get those healthy control tissues from younger populations. Great. Thank you for your comments. Thanks to the panelists for some very good suggestions. It's our job, again, to take this information, try to synthesize it, come up with, gosh, I can hardly believe it, six, six to ten recommendations. We'll do our best to have that available for people tomorrow. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Mike. The next group up is from topic, what we're calling topic three. And if uh, Jonathan could come up, and Nadav, and Dana, and Neville. Okay, great. So our uh, group is supposed to talk about uh, characterizing functional consequences of genetic variation. So as you might expect, there's some amount of overlap with the, the topics that were uh, just covered, but I think we've got some, uh, some, some other aspects that are uh, quite distinctive. So in thinking about this area, we decided to, to split the topic up into what we saw as, as five main subtopics. And so this slide briefly summarizes what those are, and then uh, each of the three panelists are going to spend a little bit of time going through these. So uh, the, the first kind of revision that we did was, that we made was to uh, think about um, the ways that genetic variation is affecting um, function uh, first in cis, and then in trans, and, and then um, how those effects sort of flow outside of cells to, to affect um, development and organism level phenotypes and so on. Um, and, I, and then a slightly orthogonal kind of topic direction is, is in number two, and this is an idea that, that, that Jay talked about a little bit in his overview talk right at the beginning, uh, which is this uh, idea of the Manhattan Project of, of gene functions, what does every gene in the genome do? Um, and then the, the last topic, number five on there, um, is, is to understand uh, how genetic variation uh, acts in, in the context of our environment. And, um, so we'll talk about that last. And one thing that I want to emphasize is that on the slides, we've, we've focused in large part on kinds of data that we could collect and some of the, the big questions. But I think it goes, well, it's, it's important to say, of course, that in all of these areas, we've got, um, you know, there's, there's an important need for, for technology development um, and for data production. But, but in particular, although we don't have very much in detail on the slides about this, um, data analysis, and, um, and new computational methods for interpretation are, are absolutely essential for all of these areas. So let me hand it over to you, and, I, um, and, and Neville's going to go first. Sure. So I, I think this is a really nice organization that, that Jonathan and Nadav put together here, actually, with these, these different levels of analysis. And so I think what you'll see here on the, on the slides that we put together is, as Jonathan mentioned, that it's quite general, it's quite open. I think we're, we're going to try and shuttle you through maybe in just a few minutes uh, through these few levels and then have most of the time actually for, for discussion. We can try and uh, flesh out the details here. So the first one here is about um, cis regulation. Uh, this has been a topic that's come up time and again, I guess, the last two days, linking variance and regulatory elements to the target gene. So the big goal, the big, big idea of what we want to want to achieve is a complete atlas it's kind of a daring thing, complete atlas of regulatory elements and variants across some number of cell types, some number of conditions. These are the kind of details that can be filled in. Um, and of course, this has to go hand in hand with also developing computational models for interpretation. I think so far, the kinds of perturbation assays you see that have been done by many of the folks in this room have been uh, smaller scale and really not given the full computational breadth maybe that, that, that they should be. Um, and of course, you know, the, the, I, I think that the nice goal to work toward is perturbation of every single nucleotide in the genome, coding and non-coding. 
um, and to, to look at its, express, its uh, effects on phenotypes like gene expression, but also other relevant phenotypes um, for the model, for the disease, for the trait. Um, uh, of course, the idea is, is, is not just to perturb every single nucleotide, but maybe we can also think about more focused assays looking at sets of variants, trying to identify causal variants out of um, a, a confidence set from, say, GWAS, and then trying to say, of once we identify a variant that seems to have some effect, what's, what gene is it working, working through? And there's many examples now, elegant examples from folks where it isn't working through the nearest gene. Um, and what kinds, I think something to discuss is what are the quote, rapid phenotyping screens and platforms. Um, kind of in, in some areas like cancer biology, I think it's been very direct and easy. It's growth, it's drug resistance. Um, but then there's been uh, talk today from, from Tom, from others of uh, ALS, neurodegenerative disease. I think it's uh, not easy there. It's a little bit from experience. Um, OK, so then the next one is, this is the last one I think that I'm going to speak about, which is what, what does every gene do? We have these things like genome-wide CRISPR screens. Uh, we have uh, had for many years genome-wide overexpression libraries, ORF libraries, RNAi knockdown libraries. So there's many different um, ways that we can manipulate every gene in the genome. So, so what, is, what is the big goal? The big goal is a complete atlas of genes matched with functions, which what does that mean? How, are there an infinite number of functions? Which are the ones that to focus on first? Um, and I, I mentioned this before that there's endophenotypes like biochemical phenotypes like RNA expression, attack seek, um, histone modifications. These ones I think are, are probably the, the maybe one or two year goals where we can pair gene manipulations with, with these kinds of uh, genomic readouts. But we should also think what other traits, what other disease relevant phenotypes beyond cancer perhaps even, uh, can, can, should, we, uh, should we focus on, can we work on? Um, combination of coding and non-coding. Again, this, the same thing here, developing rapid phenotypic screens. And I, I don't know if, Jonathan, you mentioned in the beginning that all of these suggestions that we put on these slides are from the ones submitted, right? This is, I'm, I'm the reader. These are not my ideas. This, is, this came from the submitted set from the entire group. That's, so some of this looks very uh, duplicative, but it's because it's, it's what people said without knowing what everybody else is saying. So just like we were talking about causal variants, cis-regulatory variants, the data, data generation, the analysis uh, has to, the challenge is how do, you, how do you put together that complete atlas of gene functions? That complete is hard, but um, some atlas of gene functions that's easy for a large group to access. It is not the siloed CRISPR screens that I and other people have been responsible for right now. So OK, hand it off. <laughs> Uh, next in the office is going to just tell us about trans. Three. Yeah, so number three is trans regulatory effects within cells, network effects, and cellular phenotypes. And here the goal is really to generate high throughput measurements of trans regulatory effects in every gene in diverse cell types, not just in a specific cell type. We would want basically tools that generate dense measurements of trans networks, usually in cellular perturbations, it's single cell measurements and really becoming a much more dense and much more uh, specific, if we can. And then tools for measuring molecular and cellular phenotypes following these perturbation, and again, uh, better coverage and better um, also cell type specificity, which I think the field is a bit lacking. And so in total, if we can, and of course everything will be needed to do with data generation, which will be assimilated to the public, and that will be through transregulatory network across many cell types, which we hope a lot of people will use much more. And with that, I'll hand it on to Dana. So the fourth topic um, coming from topic three is the effects of genes or more broadly gen uh, genetic variants on development and organism phenotypes. So here the goal would be high throughput measurement of variants in organisms and organo organoids, not just cells or signal cells. Um, so here we would be looking for high throughput assays that use organisms and organoids. Um, to test the effects of the variants, um, different perturbations in different cells and measuring cell-cell interactions. Um, uh, definitely an emphasis on rapid and informative phenotypic assays in organisms and animal models. And the data generation expected here would be a variant and phenotype at atlases. And finally, for number five, we've got understanding gene-environment interactions. Um, so the goal here would be high throughput approaches to accurately measure E. Um, so context is clean here. Um, you could argue that the single cell level, tissue level, and maybe model organism level, it's actually much 
easier to measure E, and so here the challenge would be the high throughput assays that would accurately affect, uh, accurately measure the uh, effect of that environmental exposure um, in a high throughput manner, so the high throughput phenotyping assays here um, and approaches. For humans, it's a much more difficult problem because we really don't measure E very well at all. Um, so here, um, NHGRI actually does have a history of um, uh, really catalyzing our use of electronic health records for electronic phenotyping, and so maybe in the same vein, um, really catalyzing the use of EHRs, augmented it with other data to extract out rel um, relevant environmental exposures, maybe merging with other data sets, um, uh, supplementing with uh, merging wearable da uh, data, biomarkers, um, even outside databases. So not just individual level uh, environmental exposure data, but community level, socioeconomic status, social determinants of health, outside databases such as air monitors from uh, collected by the EPA. Um, and finally, harmonization and standards for human collection of environmental data, very, very important. And HGRI has funded efforts in this um, area through uh, the Phoenix uh, project. Um, and so we're, we're still in desperate need of this because uh, unlike genome-wide association studies, it's very difficult to combine these data sets across cohorts because there are no standards or harmonization um, um, uh, kind of frameworks that have been used to effectively help us combine those data for the powerful studies that we're going to need in humans. So um, it, it, that one is a bit more daunting in multi-year, um, I would think. So the data generation here expected to be a repository of genotype, phenotype, environment relationships in general. Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, so now uh, we'll open this up to discussion. So let me just take you back to the, the beginning, which um, uh, outlines the, the topic areas that, um, uh, that we proposed. And uh, so uh, comments, questions, um, uh, including things that weren't covered under these. Yes, thank five. you, thank you, yes. Um, including things that are not covered in particular. Trey. Okay, thanks, Jonathan, for putting together a really nice organization. And I, I want to talk specifically about uh, the trans regulatory networks. First of all, I wholly second or, uh, you know, throw support behind that, that goal as a resource that, that this institute could uniquely generate. I wanted to make a suggestion about the approach. So um, the concern would be if you just rely on molecular perturbations followed by profile measurements, um, many of those interactions are going to be completely indirect. And so uh, one suggestion for additional data that could really be, be useful there gets back to being suggestion of, of direct interaction measurements with, say, protein DNA or DNA DNA uh, interactions to complement those, those perturbational types of, of studies if the goal is to look at networks. And then, of course, if you're interested in, in effects outside of the nucleus, then you're talking about following up those with, say, protein-protein interactions. Uh, and, and certainly in our own work, I think in many others also in, in, in the cancer mutation um, analysis field, you find that, that you really need these direct interactions to knit together how different variants or somatic mutations influence the same uh, subnetworks, if you like, or protein complexes or organelles. Uh, and, and just the perturbational data hasn't been as informative. Thank you. All right, so Mathieu Lupien again from the Princess Margaret. So I have two points to raise. So uh, the first one, which is like um, very nice work, but at the same time, I, I hear a lot of gene-centric focused analysis. Uh, and I would like to put forward this notion that the genome can be partitioned in many different ways, not just gene-centric. And so if you partition the genome, for instance, based on systromes, right, the sum of binding sites for a given transcription factors, and you look for a burden of variance within those, you'll identify, you'll prioritize some systromes over others in a given disease site as being burdened by variants. And that points out to a function towards variants affecting these TF. And if it's the burden genome-wide, then it doesn't have to be affecting a single gene. It can be that in that process, it changes the equilibrium for that transcription factor such that it suddenly binds more to certain sites or it binds less to other sites because it's been disrupted globally at a collection of sites based on variants. So I think it's important all, overall just to consider partitioning our genomes in a different way than just on a gene-centric perspective because that can still give us a first layer of information that's going to be highly informative. 
Um, the second point with regards to the G and E relationship, so the environment, um, maybe following up on the first comment, a, su a suggestion would be from my perspective to actually prioritize environmental exposure that has to do with metabolism since there's a very close relationship between epigenetic reprogramming and metabolic adaptation. I think that if you want to be able to have a rapid assessment of how environment can influence genome function, to be able to focus on those that are most likely to affect the epigenome, uh, it was a good, a good way to start. Thank you. Just, just to respond to the first one. Just to respond to the first one, I was going to say that I, I think that's a gr great idea not just to use variants as a way to prioritize uh, non-coding regions, but to go beyond just human genetics and use things like transcription factor binding sites. I think that can answer questions about like cooperativity. Can a single uh, transcription factor binding site have an effect on a gene or on other things? Um, or uh, you know, how, how that, how, what's the logic, how does that work? So I think that's a, that's a really nice idea about the cisterns. Great, thanks. Uh, Eric. Yeah, so this was brought up before, but this idea about um, <clears throat> uh, what is a gene and so forth. And I think that's also going to cause a lot of problems if you try to have a goal of, of functionally characterizing doing something to all genes where um, that concept may not really exist in a clear format in the actual real biology. Uh, and so, you know, is these, the exons, the exons plus the introns, uh, they vary from one person to another and they're splicing and so forth. Uh, and you get even fusions of some exons between genes. So uh, even I use the gene word there. So I, I, I think maybe a more useful way of, of doing about this may require redefining of what that means. And that redefinition could be of a, a particular sequence of, of the particular you know, sequence within a certain range of divergence uh, in the genome, what's its function, uh, whether it's a particular protein domain or an entire protein coding sequence or something else, and, and coming up with a term, a new term maybe to describe that, and then say we'll describe all of the genomic character of the genome or just this part that makes proteins or otherwise. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry. Uh, I can't see who everybody is from this distance, but... <laughs> Me? <laughs> uh, this is Carrie Getz. I work at the yeah. National Eye Institute. Okay. And, uh, I should the... work on my eyes, sorry. Oh, that's okay. One of the... <laughs> Maybe get some glasses. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, to the last point uh, that you made um, in your uh, introduction when you're talking about combining data sets and how you need standards, and um, one thing that I've been involved in at the NIH for many years is kind of building on what Phoenix started with the Common Data Elements Repository. And I'm happy to say that the NIH has a data science um, strategic plan that they've put forward. And as part of that, our uh, Common Data Element Task Force that's trans-NIH, so all the ICs participate, did propose a master reference dictionary resource that the NIH would fund on all levels. So I think um, I would recommend the NIH, NHGRI, you know, get behind that effort and maximize um, the collaboration there. And, and our uh, scope of work says that that should be launched in a year for the first iteration. So, yes, thank, thank you. Um, so, I think uh, another um, maybe issue we could bring up in, in that same vein is um, uh, investigators adopting those standards. So, you know, Phoenix has been around for several years, and yeah. um, it just for a variety of reasons, people just don't adopt it until you're faced with, oh, I can't combine my data with yours because we don't have things labeled the same way, or it's difficult to find out if how you measured smoking the same way I measured smoking. Yep. Yeah. I, I would say that uh, a lot of the ICs have found success in writing it into their grants mm -hmm. um, and making it mandatory. So yeah. that's so the carrot So the carrot and the stick approach. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but once you can combine data and, and, and show that, um, efficacy, then I think you're going to be smooth sailing. And if there's a central place people can look, make it easy, that's another uh, component. So that's what we're trying to accomplish there. And I, I would add to make it easy also um, for um, data repository or data sets that have already been deposited in something like dbGaP. I know Phoenix was going back and trying to map back. Um, and so if there are um, more concerted efforts to do that, because anything that makes it easier on the investigator end, um, that'll, that'll make the combining of data sets and uh, analyses and subsequent discoveries that much faster. I would just, uh, this is my own soapbox, so I'm speaking on my own behalf, um, but mapping back is a poor scientific uh, uh, No one wants effort. to do it. It is I, it's well, not no, glamorous. I would say it doesn't even like result in statistically significant data, so I totally think you should do the work on the front. 
um, instead of mapping back later. Yeah. But that's my own little you know, caveat. So. Yeah. Uh, and so there are other things I'm sure we had to discuss, but I just want to say that it's, it, it is a shame that we have so much data already collected. It is so hard to collect exposure data on humans, especially at the cohort, with cohorts. Um, there are very few big cohorts being funded right now. Um, so it, mapping back still, I think, has utility because we have so much data. That's just my two cents. Okay. Those, you, you, I'm sorry, I can't see your names. Uh, yes, you. <laughs> I can't see your name. Uh, Stephanie Hicks from Johns Hopkins. So going back to the problem way back on overcoming cultural divides and silos and training uh, to tackle many of these important problems that you have here and the ones that we've been discussing uh, the last two days, um, it can be, I'm a quantitative person, it can be daunting to listen to um, jargon in a field that you're not necessarily intimately familiar with. So for example, genetics, and it can also be daunting, vice versa. It can also be daunting for a quantitative person to go seek formal training in genetics just to be able to understand that and vice versa. Um, so one way you can address that is collaborations. That's more of like a long-term thing. And one thing, one recent experience that I had um, that was very positive in terms of overcoming those cultural divides between genetics and quantitative people or biological people was um, innovation labs. So it was a project, it was a week-long workshop funded by the BD2K in which they brought together quantitative people and biology people. They were all assistant professors and they all had sort of uh, projects in mind that they wanted to discuss and they all came from very different perspectives with very different training and we quickly were able to overcome some of those cultural divides and it forced us to sort of work together and put together projects and ideas on how to overcome and um, how to overcome the cultural divides and then make or propose solutions to the problem. So I would love to see the NHGRI fund more of those. I thought that was very useful. Just to follow up on that, that's a great suggestion. This is also actually brought up in the ENCODE meeting that we just had recently of trying to get more computational people in wet lab and vice versa so people can really understand what they're doing and collaborate better. And I do want to just put in a plug. Um, so we have talked a lot about diversity and participation in research. Not a whole lot about diversity in training um, and beyond the T32 or um, other mechanisms for postdocs and pre-docs, but really reaching into undergrads to excite them about our field because we do cool stuff um, and I just don't think they're exposed to it. Um, and they'd be really amenable, I think, to the kind of learning about collaboration early on in that team science approach. Um, so I would encourage everybody to think, whether it's at the funding level or even as an investigator participating in something like Abracams, um, I know a couple of you here have been speakers there, but um, the systems and computational biology section is the smallest section at Abracams, and I think we could do better. Great, thank you. Uh, Tim. Yeah, uh, Tim Ray from Duke. So a lot of uh, these areas, we keep bringing up technology development, and you know, one thing that comes to mind for me a lot is getting technology development funded through NIH can be really challenging, and I think a lot of it has to do with the exploratory nature when you get into, you know, uh, not quite sure what the results are going to be. It's hard to write grants around that. I think a lot of it has to do with the timing. Oftentimes, we've wanted to develop a technology, and by the time the grant is reviewed, we've already, you know, finished the paper, and uh, you know, so so the grant review is is so much slower than we want to push the technology. And so I'm wondering if, you know, maybe over the next 10 years, there's ways that an year I can think creatively about how to more efficiently fund technology development. Um, Maybe it's smaller grants with faster review cycles. Maybe it's, um, you know, I think it has to go beyond just calls for specific R01s. I think that's one way we could, you know, really skyrocket and, and lead the field in how to fund technology development at, at the government grant level. Okay, thanks. Uh, Barack? Yeah, I wanted to just say a word about phenotyping. I'm really excited about the high throughput phenotyping, molecular phenotyping, things that are scalable. I think that's all great. I think we also should measure uh, success by how much these technologies diffuse out into the wider world. So, for example, if large collections of variants and the methodologies to make those variants diffuse out into the wider world, then we outsource our phenotyping to everybody. Um, and we get, we, get, we get more. We don't just get RNA levels or the things that we're good at measuring. We take advantage of people who have spent their entire lives developing one particular system. And I think, I think the other thing it does is it, it circumvents some of these discussions about what's the right model. Should it be cell lines? Should it be tissues? Should it be organisms? We just let the, we just let the wider world do it for us. Okay. Uh, so Tuli? 
Yeah, so I wanted to comment on the uh, CIS regulatory effects of, of variants. So obviously during the past 10 years, CIS EQTL mapping and other sort of CIS regulatory variant mapping in populations has been basically the primary high throughput workhorse for, for doing these things. And, and, and now we have GTEx and all of these big maps, and I basically wanted to share a couple of results coming out of those studies, and uh, like thinking if that study design is actually useful going, going uh, forward. And one of the things that is coming out of GTEx, <coughs> now that we have sample sizes in many hundreds, in many tissues, is that when we do computational deconvolution of cell type composition in those tissues and start to map uh, genetic interactions, so basically kind of uh, cell type interacting EQTLs, we actually gain a lot in resolution. We're able to do better fine mapping. We get to the causal variants better. We're able to do better co-localization of GWAS findings. And we also see that basically a lot of the tissue sharing or tissue specificity of regulatory effects is basically just sharing of cell types between different tissues. And, and, and I mean, this is not really surprising that when you take a bulk <laughs> tissue, your EQTL mapping there is just mashing a bunch of independent signals from different cell types together. But I think that that is, um, it's, it makes interpretation of some of the current data a little bit more complicated, but thinking about cell type specific EQTL studies, I think can still be a very, very worthwhile study design to think about going forward. Now, yes, that thank we, you. now that we actually have single cell technologies that, mm -hmm. uh, that will soon be scalable to population sample sizes. Right, right. Um, yeah, Eric. So in addition to all the amazing content, there were a couple of suggestions about mechanisms. Um, I think it would be interesting to ask, are there mechanisms that would generate large data sets and make them available as challenge problems to the community. We have a model of build a consortium where we build a lot of data and then everybody gets together and has a very large number of, of very satisfying conference calls and eventually writes papers about it. But it'd be interesting to explore models of generate some well-defined data sets, get them out there as challenge problems, and who knows, I'll just make crazy suggestions invite computational people from all over to, to try to attack them. And some of the rewards could be you get a grant if you like have the best thing. Um, you know, because it might encourage people who produce really good work but might not view really well at study sections or other things. Obviously, we can't switch everything to that, but it might be interesting to ask, are there models that could both draw in the community and, and, and reward uh, people in unusual ways. Um, you know, I, there are probably better ways to, to do what I'm suggesting, but I think there's a chance to experiment with, with models here that, we, you know, this might be a really good time to try. That could also work well for what Tim, Tim Reddy mentioned, I think, with the tech development being faster than the grant cycle. Yeah, that, that's actually what made me think of it, was Tim's comments about the tech, and I think computation may have the same set of issues. Great, thank you. Um, Anshul. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on uh, Eric's comment about challenges. Um, so I think one of the ways to actually do this effectively is to get community buy-in in the challenge design itself. A common mistake that's main, made, I think, in, in running these challenges is, is some external party designs a challenge based on what they think. And when the challenge is proposed, the rest of the community completely rejects the challenge design itself. And to me, like having looked at Dream and, and KG and others, which are really nice frameworks for designing challenges, the one mistake they make and we have made as well, like we ran an encode challenge uh, where we think we should have, you know, we missed a, a small little wrinkle in how to design the challenge. It was otherwise okay, but I'm just suggesting that we should have calls for challenge design. We should have community agreement on challenge design then collect the data so that, and that will have community buy-in so that the participation increases. Otherwise, you just have, you know, very small population of the actual research community playing in those challenges, which is very different from CASP and many other uh, events. Okay, uh, Mark and then Stephen. Uh, I just want to uh, follow up on the two points very quickly. I'll just say in relation to challenge design, Anshul did mention uh, CASP, and one of the really nice things about that challenge, in addition to the participants, potentially being able to uh, maybe write a grant. There's also just the idea of publishing the results. I mean, I think that challenge has become a 
nucleus for people working on that particular problem in terms of um, publishing the results and also uh, people um, putting in data. And the second point was in relation to Tuli's comments. I concur very much and want to amplify her comments. I mean, I've been involved in a brain study and we found that uh, coupled single cell data was extremely useful to deconvolute a lot of the, the effects. In fact, the bulk of the um, EQTL effects were actually cell type proportion <coughs> effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, and that, that also relates to the point that Aviv made in the previous session as well. Um, uh, yeah, Stephen. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on the on the uh, challenge model. This is something that's been looked at in some other institutes. For instance, NCI, we are developing right now a challenge for mutational signatures where we would put two or three very large data sets in the cloud. Whoever wants to come bring their model, they run it. And again, this is this issue of bringing the analysis to the data so everyone else can see what the performance looks like, not only the outcome, but be able to compare and learn from that to improve and work on the code or give suggestions or whatever, because often different people coming in from slightly different perspectives will highlight some very interesting things in the data set, and there isn't necessarily a single right answer, but those, those comparisons allow you to start to see where there are differences that could be incredibly revealing for mechanistic or biologic or you know, a computational solution. So uh, this is going forward, and I think as Eric had mentioned, you know, there may be rewards in terms of funding or whatever. And that's a tricky thing that NIH is having a hard time figuring out how to do it, but I, our current director, Ned Sharpless, is very keen to do this in several different cancer-related venues. Okay. Yeah, Thank you. Just to follow up on that, I mean, we, have, we haven't we have run the challenge particularly at NHGRI, but we do fund them, and you can actually, if you read, for people, this is partially an advertisement for people on the watching the webcast as well. If you read our genomic resources, it actually allows proposition of challenges, and we did that in collaboration with NCI. I do think, to Anshul's point, the challenge, I think the challenge is doing good challenges, and so thinking about how to do that, and I would love, and I, I love the idea of giving a grant, but then my head explodes at the idea of that being something that we could um, legally do at NIH. But I think thinking about meaningful rewards that might not circumvent our entire grants process would be an interesting thing for people to think about, and we would certainly be open to feedback on that. Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, Gil in the back. Yeah, I love where this thread is going. Just a tiny comment. You know, I think Anshul mentioned it yesterday, right? The hardest thing about a challenge is finding a referee. So, so one thing that other communities do, they put out benchmarks. You know, they don't call it a challenge. They just say, here's a large data set, see how well you can do on it, and people offline go and try to bite it off as much as they can. So that has disadvantages of its own, but the main advantage is it's there, anybody can play with it anytime, and you don't need a referee, you just need a good set. We could do it tomorrow with variant, you know, pathogenicity prediction. You just tell people, these 2,000 genes, with all of their variants, do not train on them, only test on them, and let's see how well you do. That's it, simple as that. So, so challenges are wonderful, but you can add benchmarks <coughs> and then you move much more quickly and other communities thrive on that completely. Thank you. So our committee's charge is to come up with a, a list of um, precise topics or uh, study areas for tomorrow. And so I want to kind of bring the discussion back to, back to this, whether, whether these are the right five topics, whether there are topics you think that we should be adding or deleting, or whether these should be modified. Sharon. I would just say for the GDE to go back to something that Dana said, NHRI doesn't have an epidemiology branch. So we haven't done a lot of epidemiology. The other institutes do. So you don't want to design a project that says we need to learn how to do and to measure things that other groups already know how to measure. I would just echo when you're thinking about projects, there are a lot of existing data sets with good epidemiology, but have very poor genetic um, evaluation so far, maybe a SNP chip, and that's it. So I do think thinking about some G to E studies using well phenotyped environmental exposures that might be from NCI with regard to smoking or NIEHS might be one way to think about projects and not defining how do you measure phenotypes. Thank you. Uh, uh, Howard. 
Uh, Howard Chang from Stanford. Uh, I want to highlight uh, the project three, the trans-regulatory effects. This is something that's clearly within reach with many recent technologies to do so even in single cells. And a really exciting aspect, I think, really comes from the combinatorial aspects when you think about regulators that have you know, synergistic or buffering effects, basically one rescues the other. That's what you want to know, right? If you have this defect, what would it take to, let's say, rescue the phenotype? Uh, but then this, the complexity of the combinations actually will get big very fast. For example, you think about uh, perturbing every link RNA or perturbing two link RNAs. Uh, I challenge you to decide which two link RNAs should go together first. Right? This is not a solved problem. Or let's say two link RNAs plus one TF. Mm -hmm. Okay, which ones are most interesting? And the space gets, so I think we need to learn a lot more to even thoughtfully build these kinds of studies. Yes, yeah, so, so your, your point on the interactions is, is a really good one, but I would argue that we don't even know very much about marginal effects yet. And that there's, I mean, so, so for example, perturbations with one gene at a time are, are, are already going to uh, dramatically increase uh, our knowledge, although I mean, your, your point on combinations is important. Um, were you going to follow on for that, Aviv? Okay. <laughs> and then I'll I come do to it briefly. Um, to follow on that, I agree we don't know the marginals, and I definitely agree with Howard we don't know how to choose which ones interact. But because interactions are actually pretty sparse in all likelihood, you can probably just squeeze a lot more information by perturbing a lot of things at once for your marginals and his mm -hmm, interactions mm -hmm. at the same time. So there's... I think saying let's go for interactions after we figure it out, each of them individually, is, is a pity. Okay, thanks. Uh, Andy? I guess it <clears throat> depends on how broadly you define trans-regulatory effects. It could be everything else, but uh, there's, there's nothing here, and there was a lot of discussion yesterday on the effects of repetitive regions of the genome on, on uh, gene function. Yes, thank you. Good point. Jonathan, if ever, if we run, oh. Hi, Brittany Lassane from Hudson Alpha. I just want to underscore and piggyback on what Tim said earlier about technology development and how that needs to happen quickly. And I want to throw in and amplify the idea that bioinformatics has to be part of that and not an afterthought. We're talking about generating a ton of data here. And in order to move from a catalog to actionable metrics, things like mechanism, um, we're going to need new bioinformatics um, approaches to do that. And so in particular, things that we've talked about like imputation, uh, transfer learning, um, those sorts of things. So I just want to amplify um, that before we close. Yeah. Thank you. Great point. I have a specific suggestion I just want to make. This, I, the people here on this committee know the suggestion because I, I made it to you guys yesterday, which is that um, just very specifically to what Tim said is last year or maybe the year before, there was a somatic uh, cell editing consortium with a whole bunch of funding opportunities. I think this is from the office of the director. I'm not sure uh, exactly what part of NIH it came from. But maybe NHGRI could consider something similar for, since so much of this depends, this is totally in my own personal interest here, but so much of this depends on new um, genome manipulation technologies, that there could be something similar for, for these goals, for this kind of variant interrogation, specifically technology development grants that also includes uh, ways of integrating these kind of very large data sets that's completely absent. So that might be something to, to consider. Thanks. So I'm astonished that we may have exhausted the comments. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so we're a few minutes early, but I think if there are no objections, we can. Uh, yeah. As long as and everybody this, feels like all their ideas got Yeah, La last call for questions and comments? OK. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to? Uh, before you go, I think we, yeah. do we have any wrap up? So I, uh, we've given instructions to the topic leaders for um, putting their ideas in for uh, presentation tomorrow during the prioritization discussion. Um, and we're, uh, if anyone has any questions, we're, we're here. And uh, Adam, do you want to say anything else? Yeah, I, I, I do. And I, I just want people to, I, I'm a little worried that in the division of the topic discussions between today and tomorrow, this is general for all of them, that, that uh, if, if you're waiting to hear ideas that you think are important and you're anticipating 
if you can reasonably anticipate that they're going to come up in the other two topic sessions, that's, that's fine. Uh, we can deal with them then. But if you look at the other two topic sessions and you're really worried, now is the time to raise them. And I'll raise, I'll raise one. It doesn't need extensive discussion that I haven't heard. At some points, I heard a lot of enthusiasm for, um, for better assays for, the, for measuring the more difficult parts of the genome to measure. And, uh, and it didn't come up as strongly as I heard it in other places. Um, and I didn't hear it in as much in either of the, these two sessions today. So I'm, I'm asking, especially these two sessions, as you go back and think about what to include, that you consider how that might be incorporated, because I did hear it, I did hear it pretty strongly. That's controversial. People should, should react. Um, and if there's anything else like that that people haven't heard and are, are worried and are ideas at the level that was presented here, um, you should at least shout them out so the two groups are aware of them and can think about considering them. And, and we've got uh, like four minutes to do that. So. Well, well, Adam, I, I, I confess I, I've gotten confused. Uh, so we've, we had uh, reports back from breakout sessions and we have lists of projects and, and that have a support for that. Is the process we're going through now the filtering on those, and 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 if if, if what we'd suggested before didn't make it onto uh, the, if, this panel, if, if we're supposed really, to say we we, we, really we were absent, serious. If it's you're really not seeing it, you should say we're really not seeing this. There's a bunch of them. Yeah, there's a bunch of them. As one of the topic leads for tomorrow, and I can say it's not on our list. Um, it, we really need to be pointed to those specific summaries from the breakouts, because we're just pointed to this whole Google Drive with lots of notes. I think those breakouts would be particularly helpful for us. We can do that. They are on the Google Drive, and, and we will we'll, we'll, we'll put a separate folder for those to. Perhaps there could be with some, some way of actually um, adding extra topics that are not included within the four topic groups to like in, that, into the that, final that list. That would be great. Um, yeah. Just because I, I think that the, the definitions of the topic groups and the way that we've come to these, this list might, yeah, there might were, miss we were, something. Our goal here was to take an orthogonal view, okay. but we were hoping everything would fit into one of these okay. four topics. Um, so if that's really not working, we can make another topic, uh, grab bag miscellaneous. But I'm, I'm, I think if it loosely fits into uh, one of these, they, it might be easier for, for process. Okay. Um, I think a lot is going to fall into topic four, okay. which are data sets, methodologies, technologies. Okay. Um, so maybe that's the place. I don't know if you might get mad at me for saying that, but but she's talking to somebody else right now, so we can just say that they're all going to go there. Carolyn, you wanted to have to suggest make a suggestion? Oh no, I was just going to say I think I agree. I think that we there is the sort of gra there is the doesn't fit clearly part, and so I think we can reconvene on that and make sure that that's getting covered and mm -hmm. and transferred into the sort of last the synthesis and prioritization. Part. So we'll take a look at that and sort of call on the topic groups to make sure they are green in terms of the things that we're, we're doing with that. Um, can, I, can I make one plea uh, because we're on it? For those of you, for the. Sure. For those of you who are seeing something that you think is really missing, Please work, please, I ask you to work hard to figure out which topic it would go in and what it's related to. Because, uh, because I, what we don't, what we want to avoid is minor, at, especially at this level that we need to look at things, we want to avoid having minor uh, differences between things that are clearly quite related um, because we have asked the topic people to try to condense. And so we push them to condense um, because we need sort of, we need to be able to get our heads around it. Um, so we ask you to, to help them do that if you're going to suggest something that you really think is missing. 
I, I did have a question, Adam. If we're actually going to be voting on priorities in some way, it, what we'd really like to know to see is that ballot an hour or two to sort of. So that's the stage where you want to know, is it there or not, right? Yeah, so we'll try to create some time tomorrow when we have the, the lists from all the topic folks. But the way the agenda worked out, uh, the people who went today have the luxury of dinner and breakfast to, to put things together. The folks that go tomorrow, please have mercy on them, because they have a very short period of time to do that. Um, uh, um, but yes, the idea is that we're, gonna, we're going to try to do some, it's a little experimental. Uh, we have to see how many different subjects we get to know exactly how to, exactly the details of how we're gonna do it, but we do want a dot storm vote. I wanna point out, uh, reiterate what Mike Benke said. Um, we're not, we're, we are not gonna use the results to say this got, you know, eight votes, we're definitely doing, and this only got four, we're definitely not doing it. No, we, we need some way to get a consensus from everybody and to help focus our attention on what needs development. And, and again, all this also will feed into additional planning processes, so there are, it will all get mulled over. Elise, did you want to say no, something? I was just going to say that, reiterate, or sorry, what exactly what you were going to say was this is not a a binding vote. This is really to help give us some sense of prioritization. I also think that if there are certain topics that come up that we, you feel like we have, we've just barely scratched the surface on that really need more in-depth discussion, please fla flag those for us. We can always have a follow-up, you know, three-hour webinar on something. We don't, you know, you can do it from a nice, warm locale, whatever. But um, if there are are things that you think need a lot more uh, discussion, that we, you know, we can we can do that and and there are other things we're considering for example having a having a vote tomorrow and then thinking about the results and then later having a revote um, there are other things that we want to do to try to to help us prioritize these ideas and to to help consolidate them uh, yeah. We start at 8 tomorrow. So. And Adam, I, I, if people have specific questions, we'll be here and come, come up here. I just, to, oh, I just wanted to just take a minute here to thank you all. I know we're going to thank you again at the end of the day tomorrow, but I feel like at the end of day two, it's a really good time to thank you all for the amount of time that you're spending here and the quality of the feedback and the input and the questions you're giving us. I, I can't stress enough how valuable I found this and how important I think these two days are and keep it up into day three. Um, you know, it's, it's, I know it can get a little tiring, but it's really, I think, going to be another important day of the meeting. And so this is yes. just my encouragement yes. to stay strong. stay strong and <laughs> stay clever and um, thank you all very yeah. much. And I want, I want to particularly thank um, the people who persevered through multiple attempts and cancellations of their travel due to weather and other things. So.